So welcome today to Designing Spaces of Belonging, which is a program co-sponsored with the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Graphic Design. Um, and as a program that Pam, Barbie, and I are both incredibly excited about. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Andy Chen and Vikas Jawad. I have known Andy and Vikas for more than 15 years since their first year of college, respectively. While they were students, Andy started his own graphic design company on campus. And if memory serves me right, Vikas worked there too. I worked with both of them on branding and design while they were students, college students. And I have collaborated with them both on much larger branding campaigns, design, and a larger than life exhibit in their professional role as the founders and partners of Isometric Studios. Andy studied sociology at Princeton University where he was awarded the Pine Prize, which is the university's highest award and distinction for graduating students. He then studied graphic design at RISD where he received his MFA as a Paul and Daisy Soros Fellow. Andy started his career at Pentagram where he worked on the rebranding of Bausch and Loam with partner Paul, Paul Asher. As a Fulbright Scholar at the Royal College of Art, Andy conducted ethnographic research on aging, sexuality, and social stigma. He's a contributor to Design Observer, Design Taxi, and Open Manifesto. And Andy has spoken at a multitude of international design conferences and has been recognized for his work. Vikas received his undergraduate degree with the highest honors from Princeton University and a master in architecture with distinction from Harvard Graduate School of Design. At Princeton, he was awarded the Frederick White Prize for his thesis on architectural apartheid in the Paris Bon Lius. Vikas previously worked at the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, SANAA, Harvard Art Museums, and Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. He is the founding organizer of Climate Collective, a New York City-based organization that sparked civic discourse about climate change through design and storytelling. Vikas has lectured at venues including Harvard University, the Center for Architecture, and Princeton University Art Museum. Both Andy and Vikas have served on the faculty at the Maryland Institute College of Art and the School of Visual Arts. Isometric Studios, their company, is based in New York City. They collaborate with leading cultural institutions, universities, tech companies, and nonprofits to reinvent the way they present themselves visually and strategically. They express the missions of these organizations through visual identities, exhibitions, websites, and signage, programs that convey intellectual rigor, aesthetic sophistication, and memorable storytelling. And I will add a sense of belonging and inclusion in profound and meaningful ways, which they will be speaking about today. They believe in design that transcends existing expectations by challenging cliches and stereotypes in visual culture. In collaboration with their clients, they shape narratives and spaces of belonging through design. They advance an ethos of inclusion, equity, and justice, centering the lived experience of marginalized people. Their projects often address complex social issues, amplifying activism on gender equity, climate change, racial justice, LGBT identity, and immigrant rights. Some of their more well-known clients include the USAID, Google Museum of the City of New York, Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, and the Center for Reproductive Rights. They've also collaborated with more than 15 departments and offices at Princeton University. And as I noted earlier, I had the pleasure to see their brilliant work up close through several of these. I would argue, um, and I truly believe, that they transformed Princeton in a multitude of ways through their vision, design, and advocacy in their professional work. Andy and Vikas were last at PCAT in 2014 in what sounds like a really amazing day and program. Pam Barbie said they were open, honest, and challenged students with a three-hour workshop on gender issues, race, and their experience at PCAD. They spoke to the question and prompt, what would they tell themselves as high school students based on what they know now, which led to a very creative results with only one hour of conceptualization and production students grew from that experience. Pam and I both believe we are so fortunate to um, you, Andy and Vikas, for being here with us today. And I please hope that people will give PCAD, a PCAD welcome to Andy and Vikas. We will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Debbie. That's uh, such a wonderful and generous, thoughtful introduction. We're so honored to be here. And I just wanna echo and recognize our history 
both with PCAD uh, and PAM, uh, having visited very early on, uh, soon after we started working together on isometric. And of course, with Debbie, who is a legend at uh, Princeton University, um, you know, somebody who worked really hard to uh, fight for and then start the LGBT center there. Um, so yeah, it's really exciting to be here. And again, it's just it's no small achievement for a university that um, has somewhat conservative politics is always behind in terms of uh, yeah, the national conversation to make it the number one LGBT school in the country. Um, at basically what seemed like overnight, but a struggle of decades. And I think that um, if it were not for Debbie, I don't know if Lacoste and I would be together. So I, I, I just, I'm so grateful and in the very deep and profound ways that I can't even describe. So um, <laughs> just, we always like to start with our personal story, kind of like situates in the context of our work. My, my parents are from Taiwan, um, they're both immigrants. And uh, my dad grew up in a fishing village. The picture on the left in this picture, this literal fishing village in Keelung, which is near Taipei. Um, and when he arrived in this country, my parents arrived in this country, my mom worked at a diaper factory and he worked um, in a manual labor job, sort of offloading shipping containers. And while they had both le some level of education, my mom had high school education um, and my dad had, you know, like sort of vocational training, uh, they really couldn't find their way in this country because of uh, the language barrier and cultural barrier. So uh, we ended up sort of settling in an immigrant enclave here, um, pictured in San Gabriel. And that was kind of, I think that has really uh, resonated with me, that sense that, you know, design is not just making things beautiful for wealthy clients and institutions, but trying to share with a broader audience uh, what value it can bring for them. And Vakas grew up in Pakistan, um, a country sort of created out of partition with India um, over a religion. And there's a history of colonialism um, that kind of uh, is always um, present when we talk about this. And to think about uh, the, the history of that colonial history without being bound to it, how can we recognize um, certain kinds of traumas that has created ruptures that it's created? Uh, we met at Princeton and both as undergraduates. Uh, this is what we looked like then. Now, what seems like a million years ago. And you know, we are in a personal relationship as well as a professional one. Happened for some time now. I started my career, as uh, Debbie said. Um, at Pentagram with Paula Scher. And that was very formative. Like the first time I was introduced to like, branding at a very, very high level. And um, you know, as those, I was an intern, right? Like, so kind of trying to learn about the field because I studied sociology at Princeton, didn't really have a connection to what being a professional graphic designer was like. So I, I kind of understand what, it, uh, what it's like to like not be born into the arts or into design, but have to find your way through it. And part of that journey was going to London um, on a Fulbright scholarship to think about what the intersections are between sociology, ethnography, and graphic design as a representation. And then in grad school at RISD, this image on the right, uh, traveling to Kenya and Uganda to work with um, a program called Evidence Action that was about uh, chlorine dispensers and deworming. And thinking about how uh, we can begin to represent people with dignity instead of just turning them into objects of pity and uh, how that could itself become a thesis um, about how we could proceed, which was, I think, pretty formative for what our studio ends up being today. Vakas, meanwhile, studied architecture at Princeton and then at Harvard, and then interned at some very well-known international firms, including Sana in Tokyo and OMA in Rotterdam. Um, and at, around, that, around the time, like, you know, I was about a year into the business, my business partner, uh, Alex, was moving on to a different sort of location and job. And so we kind of joked about working together, not thinking that it would actually happen. And then several weeks later, he's like leaving his uh, job um, at SOM to sort of help um, me uh, sort of reinvent what isometric could be as a business practice. And that's where we've been for the last seven or eight years. This is our studio where we sit today. It's also where we live. And it's kind of interesting because um, <laughs> when this was a studio, people would come in every day like, uh, uh, to their office and then it would turn over at night into sort of our living space. And um, it's interesting that like, in the Zoom world now, everybody's working remotely and several of our employees are, uh, are in different time zones. So one person's in LA, two people are in Brazil. 
and it's uh, brand new for us to work with people who are not literally in front of us and we never met in person but it's incredible um, the lessons of this pandemic as well as uh, some of the joys these are some of our clients um, they tend to be institutions so uh, um, universities museums uh, cultural organizations mostly and we have a brief two-minute video of over uh, overviewing some of our work that some of which will go into more depth. About two years ago, um, we had done a number of projects and uh, Princeton invited us to write about them and to create kind of a guidebook for anyone who's looking to commission a project that somehow involves any uh, kind of artistic discipline to create uh, spaces that signal uh, belonging. And we worked with a working group to create this 150 page report and basically outlining a number of very specific types of spatial interventions that people could undertake and talking about how we think about them when we approach public spaces and we think about inclusion. Um, and so we're just gonna show you a few representative pages from the report. And then we're gonna dive into some of the projects themselves to to, to walk you through some of the process and thinking behind, behind those projects. And you can see that each chapter then also has subtopics that are listed as you get started. And it was the first time that we started a real narrative around the kinds of work that we were doing and thinking about and connecting it to literature, to theory, and to artwork that was happening in a spectrum of uh, fields around us and within the design field as well. And it was interesting to actually give words to the design in the form of captions and stories, as well as more analytical descriptions of what is happening in an image like this, how information is being conveyed. And the audience really is a general audience, maybe someone who knows a little bit about art and design, but not that much, and to help them kind of notice and see all of these various factors. Uh, we also looked at all kinds of other disciplines. I'm showing here a couple of examples from the architecture section. And we thought about the idea of taste or form and how a lot of that is determined by education and by how history is written and who's recognized. And it's incredibly difficult for artists and designers to take a step back and say, oh, I'm gonna do something different, right? Because then you're out of, out of, out of step with the field. And so how do you do that in thoughtful ways? So we have some examples here, for example, uh, Wang Shu and Lu Wenyu working in China are critiquing both the over, overly commercial and um, fast paced building culture that has taken over in the last 20 or so years. 
and also uh, the Western aesthetic that is imported. Um, and then looking at traditional Chinese architecture as well as modernism in, in Europe to create a new syn synthesis. Here are some examples of that. So now we're gonna move into some of the projects that we have done and walk you through some of the, uh, the process behind that. And the first project we wanna share is for the USAID in uh, Washington, DC. This was one of the first projects that Andy and I worked on together. It was a big enough project that we needed to hire one other person. And in essence, we became a studio. And uh, they came to us, uh, actually Andy's professor from RISD came to us with this diagram that the USAID has cr had created. And they wanted to demonstrate uh, to Washington lawmakers, as well as nonprofit community, the importance of how American funding and investments in the developing world were changing the world and making it better and making it more secure for Americans as well. And uh, we were a little concerned to see this kind of uh, clip art type, you know, uh, organization, but it was a start. And the very next day we traveled to Washington DC on the Amtrak and looked at this room. Uh, where the exhibit was supposed to happen. It's uh, in the Ronald Reagan building, which is the second largest government building after the Pentagon. And you can see it's a postmodern design. Uh, the room has a lot of um, distractions. And so we were worried that when they show all of these projects that it was gonna look like a science fair. So how can we use design to kind of avoid that and to create something new and interesting and immersive given the opportunity of this gigantic space? They shared with us an example called Design for the Other 90%. And our critique of what we saw here was twofold. Number one, we thought that in an effort to show the device, the invention here, which is the water purification system, they're using uh, the woman almost as a prop in a crouched position. So how can we really show, her, show people in more dignified ways as protagonists in their own stories? And then secondly, the use overuse of um, statistics and big numbers also took away from some of those personal stories. So we looked at some art, art examples and precedents in the world around us that we admire, looked at JR and how putting really gigantic photography in public spaces uh, challenges this idea of an object and a viewer. And the art almost looks back at the viewer and, and creates an interesting um, spatial condition. We also thought about the content of the exhibit, which was about eradicating extreme poverty. Um, and we thought, what happens, you know, this is more of a branding exercise. What happens when you remove extreme poverty, right? And so we came up with this visual concept of extreme hope coupled with photojournalistic imagery uh, that was being taken uh, in the developing world by really great photographers and some language around that. And uh, they loved that idea. And we also started thinking about how do you get to extreme hope? And how do we organize these thousands of projects and really limit them and cur curate them so that people could leave uh, with specific things that they had learned in the exhibit? So those categories might include extreme equality. And within that, you might have three additional topics like digital inclusion, for example, the nourishment, health, knowledge, we also looked at what the space could look and feel like. And again, we were looking at examples. In this case, uh, Lina Bobardi in Sao Paulo in, her, um, in the museum she designed and the exhibit she designed, where there's a very clear organization of objects, but there's a lot of freedom in the way that you move through and experience it. So we presented two options and they wanted a synthesis of the two. And so we had these hanging panels, these large immersive panels, um, five feet in uh, height here, and it could be unlimited in length. So we decided on 20. And the, the material was really readily available, uh, semi-translucent film that's used in advertising, and the hardware we had to do custom. And the room had all of this infrastructure above, so all of these could be hung very easily. Um, and then within those panels, we wanted to tell the story a little bit differently. We wanted to start with the personal narratives of how people's lives were being changed and then go into the technology and the partnerships that allow that to happen. And they, um, initially the exhibit was supposed to be part of this room, but they gave us the whole room. And you can see we designed partner stations that have modular furniture for display 
and uh, there's the exhibition in the middle. And then there's also a space for uh, talks and demonstrations, like demo of, um, of the scientific you know, um, innovations and so on. And then finally, here are some images from the exhibit, um, had to be put up in one day. Um, the title changed from hope to progress because hope was very closely associated with President Obama at the time, and they wanted it to be kind of nonpartisan. And you can see additional elements of the exhibit here and how people are interacting. And so in this case, we really wanted the room to disappear as much as possible and for the panels and the partner stations to be lit and for people to really feel like they could uh, be transported to the places in which all of this wonderful work was being done and these partnerships were being formed. Yeah, so this was one of the hardest things we've ever done. Like it had to happen in six weeks from like the moment we started talking to them to uh, the installation, but um, it really sort of brought together different disciplines that now form our studio. So I think it was, uh, amazing looking back at it, that, that it actually happened in that time scale. The next project I want to share is um, a project from Princeton University called the Carl A. Field Center for Equality and Cultural Understanding. It's a very long name uh, that is the Center for St uh, Students of Color and the Cultural Center at, at Princeton. And um, so we were asked to do this project in the, the uh, a condition of um, Black students feeling like they their voices were being suppressed and uh, that their their lived experience was being denied at, um, at Princeton in light of um, police shootings going back, uh, as far back as Trayvon Martin, and even, of course, further back in our history. But that kind of catalyzed the movement, I think, of people feeling like their identities uh, were crucial um, to uh, supporting the narrative of the university, but that these narratives were just being sort of um, instrumentalized, but without giving anything back. And so students sort of sat in um, the, the president's office this is an image from Yale that says, oh, we're here, we've been here, we ain't leaving, we are loved. And we wanted to sort of recognize the language that was being used, as opposed to just saying that, oh, these are privileged students, you know, um, everybody has free speech, and to try to sort of create a straw man argument between free speech and people's um, dignity. Uh, I, I think that that ended up being sort of um, what, uh, uh, the kind of milieu that we were wandering in terms of the design. We interviewed and photographed students and students said things like this, in environments like Princeton, the kinds of racism or discrimination that you experience will not be easily recognizable to you. Meaning that sometimes uh, privilege kind of cloaks um, the, the, the darker underbelly of the way that people treat each other and the way that they see each other across uh, race, class, and, and gender, sexuality lines. With every project, uh, we kind of look at historical references here on the left, posters from the Memphis sanitation strike, this like tall extended um, typography or a strident simple message. On the right, um, a contemporary adaptation of that by somebody just like scrawling with their hands. So how can you create an identity that recognizes the progression of this movement, um, honors its history, but at the same time feels contemporary? Uh, we looked at art by Corita Kent on the left, uh, this tear that you could, that revealed a deeper condition and contemporary art on the right by one of our friends, Jared Key, again, creating a tear so you can see like, uh, what's on the inside. And we chose typography that at once was hand, looked handmade and tall and in all those ways that respected that history, but also warm because it was being used uh, large in a student center. We didn't want it to be too confrontational um, all the time um, in every application. So this gave the flexibility to create a visual system that focused on important values because uh, we couldn't change the name. Like, it's very hard at Princeton to change the name of anything. So um, we just focused on equality here, made it really large in some applications and then switch it out for other words in some applications. And then thought about sort of how it forms a visual system with this idea of a frame that is uh, mimicking that tear to see the uh, deeper inner condition and um, to use student quotations and photographs of students that we took in various places on campus that they said they felt like they belonged um, to create a campaign and that idea of bringing type, image, and storytelling together to create a visual identity, to bring the space of the center into the space of the campus. And then they actually asked us to literally look at the space, which had already been um, under conversation for about a year with an architect called Ballinger in Philadelphia. And it was, uh, you know, there were people of color on that team, but um, Ballinger is a very white firm 
all the partners are white. The, I think 95% are men. And so uh, they really did not know what they were doing with this project. And uh, they were asked to revitalize this, which kind of was the space as it existed, had some furniture and students critiqued it as being a doctor's office. And students said, well, we wanna feel at home in this space. And Ballinger's takeaway was, well, so let's create a literal home. So they started to call rooms living room and dining room and porch. And uh, then they selected furniture like this that was African chairs and Asian pillows. And we were really alarmed when uh, we were presented with this because we were like, you're gonna have more protests if the goal is to, to sort of you know, hear student concerns and really legitimately respond to them as opposed to just creating a token representation of their identities, then we need to do better than this. Um, the university thankfully acknowledged and um, was receptive to that feedback and asked us to work together. So Ballinger would supply furniture that was not stereotypical. And we would think about what the walls could look like if it were filled with the identity of the, um, the center itself. And so as you go in there today, uh, the first zone is called We're Here, again, parallel the language of student protesters and automatically seeds space on the wall for um, student posters and announcements. And on the right, uh, it tells the story of who Dr. Fields was, who was the first uh, black Dean of an Ivy League school. Uh, on the other side, the mission of the center condensed and made large on the wall. And as you round the corner, a collage of imagery that shows student activism, um, students celebrating together, mourning together. Above the water fountains and bathrooms, which are still a site of contest today, everyone should feel welcome in every space at Princeton. And then the graphics sort of fill the space with color and language. The second room called We've Been Here is a snapshot of the history of people at color at Princeton. It was really important to the center director uh, that it not be this kind of grayscale historical exhibit um, with a timeline, because first that would get kind of boring over time. And then the second, it wouldn't feel like a public space. Very often cultural centers are designed to look like the past. So you have this kind of like um, sepia toned um, like uh, presentation and that can feel like it's not an active history. So that ended up uh, being a way of sort of par pairing past with present, telling stories, for example, of Sonia Sotomayor on the left and Danielle Padilla Peralta on the right, who was an undocumented immigrant who became salutatorian in his class and is currently a professor of classics at the university. A third room called We Are Loved, which uh, is creating even more public space, a space for sharing, a space for um, collaboration. And here quotes of um, various authors of color sort of set right into the architecture itself, this former eating club reclaiming that space, trying to create a sense of dignity and empowerment, but also excitement and activity. And this moment in the stairwell where the name of the center is made large and viewable from the outside of the building. So the next project is also for Princeton. And here I just wanted to pause and kind of reflect on, you know, one of the challenges of being a designer and working in your own studio or your own practice is that people want to see experience and relevant projects in order to hire but in order to have experience you need to do the project so it's kind of a chicken and egg game right so one thing we always think about is what are three projects that we can send to somebody as an example and so this is something we always it's very hard but you have to take the time out to kind of reach out to outreach to for future projects and so we wrote to Ron McCoy, who is the university architect at Princeton, and we shared three projects that weren't exactly relevant, but somehow, you know, had to do with architecture. And so he reached out and said, you know, I may have a project for you. And the, the project was within a new building that was being constructed, where on the right, you can see an exterior courtyard uh, is encapsulated in an addition and turned into an atrium. And the challenge was that the, that the offices that will be here for the international programs felt that the building did not have enough character that it wasn't explicitly signaling a welcoming um, spirit of how international the university was and so could we come in and do something about that there was going to be this artwork that you can see on the right but in general the space felt a little bit void and so we started thinking about potential design installations to put in there and we looked at the history of international students at Princeton and like many other communities, you know, women, LGBT people and so on, um, 
initially Princeton always had this idea of like the the Princeton student, which is you know a, historically a white male student, and how it might benefit his education, right? Uh, but increasingly over time, that that idea of the constituency becomes uh, widens and becomes more inclusive overall, more holistically. And we also looked at other representations of what it means to acknowledge this international spirit. So flags might be one option. Um, so, uh, some of these are certainly cliches that we wanted to avoid, like having some kind of world map or welcome in different languages with different cultures represented. You know, we didn't want to do that. Um, so we thought it might be nice to basically use the biggest open space that's available and to put a banner in there that unfurls and looks totally different from different vantage points. It's almost like an amphitheater, windows are opening into this atrium and it would have a quotation that would signal, you know, this idea of welcoming. And uh, we made a model and this was the quote that was gonna go on there. Yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. So something super aspirational. But then we learned that the, uh, the architect said, hey, you know, actually that's not possible because when the exhaust fans, which are super industrial machines run, either in the case of a fire or a drill, they're gonna suck out this installation. So we had to go back to the beginning and start from scratch. And this time around, we started thinking about a potential floor installation that would again, not obstruct the artwork that was going in there, but somehow signal this idea. And so we looked at circles, which is a motif that occurs in many different cultures to signify this idea of um, belonging inclusion, but also thinking really big. And uh, we call this celestial option. And then we also had a terrestrial option that had more like geographic lines. And we started looking at different floor applications and how others were doing it. As you can see now with every project we do this and it's nice to build on you know, ideas that, that have been explored and learn from them. We love this idea of ephemerality in, in these applications where the letters are made with water, I believe, and then they disappear. Um, so they chose the circular option, the celestial which is lines, dotted lines and quotations from around the world. And it was gonna take up 7,200 square feet on three levels. And it would be embedded within the floor and sealed with epoxy as well as polyurethane. Here's a meeting when the architect and the university architect and the project manager are looking at and approving the design. Uh, samples were done from different vendors to ensure that this would be uh, at a high quality, be protected. And then the application began and it was enormous. And this was the diagram that, uh, that the vinyl um, installers had. And it goes onto the stairs as well. And of course there can be no spelling errors because it's gonna get permanently sealed into the porcelain tile. And at first you get this very reflective finish and then you add a layer of polyurethane and the matte uh, finish is restored. And uh, yeah, it's this really wonderful thing that comes in and out of view as you move through the space. The mind was dreaming, the world was its dream. And there's always something new and interesting to kind of read and be inspired by. And it emanates throughout the building, but in a way that is not overpowering. So you can visit and revisit. Decolonize, decolonize your mind. So we started in this project, we started thinking about how graphic design gets put into buildings. You know, it can't be a large poster always because it, people get tired after a while. It has to be uh, somewhat subtle, but it can still define a space and explicitly signal values. This next project is for the Museum of the City of New York. It's called Germ City Microbes in the Metropolis. So it was kind of um, interesting that a lot of our clients initially were outside of New York City. I guess because you have to build a reputation first before anybody uh, in this very competitive market will hire you to do anything substantial. And so um, we somehow, uh, through a series of different people, were connected with the museum. We sort of show them what we could do. And um, the chief curator there, Sarah Henry, who's just an incredible person, an incredible, uh, like a 26 year old, 26 um, year veteran of this museum, um, 
basically said, well, I have a project for you. <laughs> and so it was a public health um, exhibit that told the history of New York City through uh, the lens of um, germs and microbes and pandemics. And this was back uh, two years ago, three years ago? Three, yeah. three years ago when, when, um, when germs were cute and pandemics were like sort of heuristic you know, and part of the distant past. But they wanted to sort of do things like show a full-size iron lung, which helped people breathe, the, the precursor to the modern day respirator, which we are now all familiar with. But at the time people didn't really think about. Um, on the right, a full-size uh, sculpture by the artist Jordan Eagles, who uh, called the blood mirror, made from the blood of gay men. And the idea being it's a kind of a protest piece that you see yourself reflected in their blood as a way to protest the discrimination of the federal government against um, donations from gay men. And they wanted to show all these artifacts as well, um, whether reproduced or, or actual, that would <laughs> mostly talk about disease. And so our goal is like, well, all, most of these are red, like just like a visual analysis. They're mostly red, tan, and scary, right? Like, and how do you create a family-friendly, inclusive experience? Um, and there were certain members of the museum who felt like, well, you should just make it really scary so that it will get written up in the New York Times. Like, this is so scary. Like, Ripley's Believe It or Not, you should come see it. But we were like, we shouldn't just titillate people with the stories uh, for, for the sake of making them feel afraid, right? Like they should go deeper and talk about, well, that every time there's a pandemic, somebody gets scapegoated, whether it's women or immigrants or you know, people of color or LGBT people, there's always people at the heart of it who have to bear the stigma of the pandemic. Um, in this case, our most current case, uh, the China virus, so forth. And on the left, this wax moulage, for example, of a boy who's dead from smallpox. Like, how do you destigmatize that, or like make the fear become a sort of part of the story as and operationalize it? So we start looking at cute architecture by Japanese architects that already looked like microbes and were based on this idea of the organic, because most exhibits about New York City tend to be like very tall walls or a grid that have to do with you know, the city as it's like sort of stereotypically portrayed. Um, we want to think about, well, germs don't obey the laws of the city, right? They are indiscriminate in their diffusion. And so we also looked at uh, sort of urbanism by um, Andrea Bronzi, Italian architect, this idea again, that even in a re very regular grid setup, you still have these sort of um, organic shapes. And this ended up becoming inspiration for various different architectural schemes here, like windy tables around a grid, or lots of little germ tables. Uh, this was, they thought this was really cool, but not tenable because they wanted to organize um, sort of ideas by themes. And then like, okay, oh, this is starting to work. It was like a, one big table, for example, to disrupt the idea of having to break things up into separate sort of walls. Um, one open gallery with one big table, but the, the sections of the table were too small for the display and number of artifacts they wanted to include. So making those lobes bigger and actually being able to contain objects and reproductions. Here was an early schematic version of that. Like they could be positioned organically, almost like organelles of um, this like larger microbe. And that this is a, a later evolution where it kind of evolved into each lobe would um, bear a theme that you would view in sequence. And each theme would correspond to an action that a city would take, for example, containment or uh, contact tracing, um, or what they call investigation care, which is like what happens after um, it becomes a pandemic and how the hospital system has to ramp up, urban environment, um, how we uh, sort of preserve um, a healthy environment even after a pandemic has sort of spread. And um, the architecture in this case, uh, like once they approved it, the graphic design was fairly easy. We just showed a whole bunch of little mini models with different graphic schemes. And uh, they ended up choosing this one, which was um, the idea that very simple color, but that basically germs would transgress the boundaries of the city and they would free flow. And so the letters would extend and extrude in that way. Um, and then here is sort of a, a later um, unfolded floor plan where you have like the, they, they were really so supportive idea of a big blue floor um, and the color would diffuse up the walls like the diffusion of microbes in space. And then each wall section text would correspond to one of the lobes of the table. And here are sort of details of how the objects are positioned very carefully at various different viewing angles um, on the table. And here's a model of like what that overall came to look like. And then they said, well, okay, you can't touch any objects in this gallery, right? Like intended not to be interactive intentionally because a lot of them are precious objects. So how about we create a second gallery next door 
where you can touch things and interact and play games and so forth that is like to engage deeper. And so here with various different schemes, like it could be one long table or it could be like a bookshelf, it could be little tables, it could be a perimeter table in this long gallery. And they chose the baby table. So you had the, like the mama table and the, uh, the main gallery and then like many little tables, um, germs. <laughs> Again, uh, germs were like sort of you know, cute and happy back then. <laughs> And then here um, we had to test the paint because they had never painted the whole gallery in this way before with the gradient. Um, and we had to sort of you know, build prototypes of the table with the uh, vendor south side um, here in New York City. And then once uh, they saw the prototypes, they were assured that it would all work. We uh, started painting the gallery, building the table here. And it was just amazing to see it all come together spatially. Um, and so we went to the, into the exhibit. It would start in the hallway where you read uh, about the exhibit. You sit on this germ bench and watch a couple of videos. You're introduced to the history of New York City um, with, through this graph that the city produces. It's called the conquest of pestilence. Maybe a little overly optimistic um, in light of current events, but uh, it, it's just kind of showing that the, the mitigation tactics of the city really do matter because throughout time, the, um, the, the effect of pandemics was supposed to get less and less. And as you enter the main gallery, you have this like sort of immersive experience that's laboratory-like. And we heard stories about kids who saw this exhibit 20, 30 times and like the, their favorite exhibit. So I'm like, yes, <laughs> kind of did what we're supposed to do, which is that it felt friendly enough um, that you would engage with it almost like a scientist um, as a, and uh, that even the casual visitor would not be scared too much by these objects but it would not take away from the aura of the objects themselves, as well as the stories that, that were being told. So appropriate level of seriousness and talking, especially about social stigma, particularly something like this image where you're showing the, the investigative techniques and contact tracing, I, how do you make that relevant? And here's the full size iron lung. And here's a second gallery, uh, which is the reading room. And the idea would be that these little germ tables uh, would be spaces for response and play. And it was amazing seeing some of the things that people said uh, you know, about their experience with infectious disease. And it just goes to show that like, if you give people space to respond, they will, for sure. <laughs> and um, they will tell you th their honest opinion about like what they thought of the exhibit, as well as uh, sort of um, how their experience, their, their lived experience sort of uh, inflects in the story of the city. Let's have two more. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so two more projects. The next one is we did uh, for Google headquarters in New York City, and they approached us in late 2018. Um, this was before the most recent, you know, um, the 2020 events of George Floyd and so on. But already, you know, there was a lot of events that had taken place. As Andy mentioned, Trayvon Martin, 2012, Michael Brown, 2015, and there's uh, Sandra Bland, like there's so many names. So Google wanted to do a physical exhibition to take uh, engineers away from the computers and to have an educational experience about the black experience with police in America. And when we first went and met with them, they shared with us some of the research that they had been doing in PowerPoint slides. And uh, we were a little worried because on the right, you can see images that are not very dignified looking. So it almost looks like a mugshot. And then on the left, almost pseudo-scientific work that is not really delving into the stories of the people and their everyday experiences. And in, in some ways can also be uh, offensive. For example, this slide titled, How Not to Get Shot and giving uh, tips to the Black community. I mean, conceptually, the problem was that they were trying to see what could the Black community do differently about police shootings, right? And the reason that's problematic is that there, there you can never point to one group and for the actions of a few or for whatever and say this group needs to change, right? You have to think about how um, police officials whose job is to serve the community and citizens 
can do their jobs in a way that that is equal and serves every single um, constituent equally, right? Because they are being paid to do that and they're they're serving the community. Um, so we asked Google if we could travel to meet with a select number of the participants who had taken part in the study. And so we traveled to Atlanta, Georgia, um, Oakland, California, and Washington, DC. And we met with nine individuals from very diverse backgrounds um, in different fields. And we photographed them in their homes and their workplaces. And we also interviewed them. And uh, we learned a lot and people had such different experiences. But one thing that remained pretty consistent was uh, you know, negative experiences with the police. And these are not people who you know, ever ended up on the news but we learned about the everyday experience of going out into a world where you are seen as a threat and that your interactions with law enforcement are different from your white friends who might assume that the police is there to protect, to, just to protect and preserve, right? Um, so Laura, for example, said, I would tell the mother of a police officer that a lot of the feelings that she may have about black males being aggressive and being a threat, I would say that a lot of that is sensationalized. I would tell her that my sons are human, they're loved, they're smart, they're intelligent, they're gifted. And, uh, you know, we uh, spoke to others, for example, the men would use humor to recount some of the stories that uh, events that may have been humiliating to take back some of the power in that retelling of the story. Um, met with people outside their workplace in a warehouse where there's a there's a music workshop, and then we also started thinking about what this exhibit could look like. Um, here's an image from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We were really interested in this idea of the public square, this uh, site of trauma where uh, slave auctions may have taken place, but also a site where the American story is negotiated and retold. And uh, this is a set from the show Hamilton and a site where public messages are put up. And as a society, we decide, you know, what do we, what, what values do we enshrine and what do we reject? We looked at graphic design from the civil rights era, um, typography, we also looked at contemporary typography here on the left by Trey Seals, a black designer who is uh, reinventing type inspired by civil rights era. And again, we presented two options for what the exhibit could look like. And they chose this one, which is essentially wooden panels that hold each other up and in the center create a room for community reflection. This was important because we thought that after people have gone through and looked at all the panels, there should be a place where they could talk about it and process and as a community kind of update their understanding and their biases um, that might exist. And, and they always exist. You know, recently there have been a lot of uh, there, uh, moments of uh, incidents of violence against Asian Americans. And there's always this urge to think about like who to blame, you know, for us personally. And the problem is you can never ever point to a specific community generalized and say, oh, this community needs to change. No, uh, there, are, there are people of different, uh, you know, uh, different types of people in every single race, every single community. And so this exhibit is really about centering the black experience and putting it within historical context and thinking about an environment of, of discrimination, of racism, of violence that then becomes distilled into that moment of the police encounter. So very heavy topic. And, uh, you know, we worked with uh, Amber Fields, a black woman curator who traveled with us to all of these spaces. And you can see here the installation that's taking place. These are direct printed plywood panels that came in ready to be installed, which made it a lot easier, uh, but it's still a little bit more complex than it looks in how the alignments come together. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven rings Ring with the harmony Of liberty Let our rejoicing rise Let's show to victory. 
So here are some images from the exhibit and the various uh, openings that lead to different sections, some information about the participants. It was important to have uh, a lot of context in terms of history and also from liter literature and poetic ways of, of telling the story, history of redlining, of housing discrimination, and these uh, larger than life-size portraits that create an environment for a different kind of conversation to take place a history of, of policing, talking about some of the, the history of segregation, more recent um, events, and then direct quotations from the interviews that we did. And so it was a very, uh, it was a really uh, wonderful and enlightening event for the Google employees. They asked us to make posters to describe the experience of being pulled over as a black person uh, of, from what we had heard and uh, kind of really viscerally show the emotions that people go through as they're trying to figure out, get the license and registration and put putting hands on the steering wheel so there's no, um, no implication of threat to the police officer, which might endanger their own their life in turn. And this was the opening event where some of the participants came and shared their experiences as well. So Debbie, we know that uh, we're at time, so we just want, uh, we had one more project to show, but we don't know if uh, we want to stop now or. Some people may have to leave right at one, so I. I think there's interest in the other project, but um, I don't know. I, I think we can go over one for Q and A because that's our lunch hour. But but okay. some folks may have to leave right at one. Okay. So uh, what do you prefer? Do you want to start the Q and A now, or could we do the last piece? Could it be brief, or yeah. I don't know how long? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Cool. So this project is called Happy Family Night Market. <laughs> um, we're not often, at least initially, asked to design things for our own communities. And part of that was that we, uh, you know, initially when starting the firm, didn't want to be associated with like, oh, you're, you're the Chinatown design firm, uh, you know, you only need to work on Asian projects and you do things that are sort of, you know, like, uh, like less good somehow. But then over time, we started to feel like, why did we feel that way? You know, and part of it is that the best parts of Asian culture are commodified and just like sort of, you know, reduced in American culture. And we need to do something about that. So this project came along, which is street fair. Um, based on these images like this, which is a Taiwanese street fair uh, that would occur one day in New York City, bringing together arts, culture, and the vitality of the Asian diaspora. Um, and, uh, you know, we wanted to take ownership of the immigrant experience as expressed through these kind of like ecstatic expression of, um, of a celebration of food and culture. And even, even take ownership of, like, uh, you know, what these strip malls look like where I grew up and be okay with that, you know, and use it as a graphic design inspiration. So that ended up becoming a motif for branding that included all the major Asian languages spoken here in New York City. And this idea of, you know, kind of a paste up, we paste sticker identity that would be sort of fun and expressive and joyful and paired with this idea of unpeeling back the layers so that, you know, we're not all the same. And <laughs> there are so many different cultures that comprise the Asian diaspora um, that should be expressed not just dignity, but with happiness and uh, with this overwhelming emotion of celebration. And so it was a really exciting project to work on uh, that helped us sort of learn about ourselves <laughs> and our place in the city, um, you know, to create an identity uh, that needed to represent so many different people um, in their diversity. And there was an application about thinking about, okay, the physical space. So here was a, a mock-up of what we thought could happen. Of course, this was too expensive to do for you know, a nonprofit that you know, hardly had any funds. 
but we were still able to do selective stickers, <laughs> vinyl stickers in some places to help really take ownership of the space, at least for that day. And it ended up being this expression of um, conviviality, joy, and uh, like it, it, we thought it at once felt sophisticated and ad hoc, which um, kind of uh, is typical of the immigrant experience. And visibility, I think, in public space. And even though it's very quickly pasted on, there is an element of like high design. Usually, you know, you have Chinatown and everybody thinks that's like the place to go to get cheap things, but it felt kind of really elevated and visible, which made us feel very, a sense of belonging as well. Thanks. So we'll stop there. Thank you both. We, um, we want to open it up for question and discussion, and we, we will go into the one o'clock hour, but recognize that some people may have something at one and may have to leave. Um, so first, I'd like to say particularly thank you to both of you for being here and for sharing your powerful work and really open it up for, for questions. So please feel free to jump in. Unmute yourself or put it in the Q&A. So hello, folks. I'm, I'm jumping on fast because I do have a one o'clock. Thank you. Um, my name is Gretchen Hathaway. I'm the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So the first question I want to ask, and I missed the beginning, so you might have already said this. How did you develop your listening skills um, in order to produce a product? So you really had to pay attention to people's emotions and behavior um, to produce the products that you are producing. Um, how did you go about learning that and doing that in such a such a brilliant way? Well, thank you for for saying that. Do you have an immediate response? Well, I think part of it is like design is the, often thought of as this thing where you just like you go into your workshop and you make this brilliant thing, but when you're working on projects like this, um, you're dealing with like people's stories and their lives, which. Uh, it's an honor for them to share it with you, right? So I think there's a humility that like precedes the design process that's required. And I, I, I largely am influenced by sort of uh, learning to how to be an ethnographer at Princeton um, mm -hmm. from the professors um, in sociology who's like, okay, how do you ask questions that are open-ended <laughs> and that allow people the space to feel comfortable, right? Um, and, and to have a certain level of um, reciprocity where you give yourself to them as well. Um, when you show past projects, it's not just about showing like, we made these like great achievements and they're like this like amazing design, but like in sets, um, if I, we find that like, uh, if we offer a little bit of vulnerability and a window into our own experience, it can help people um, feel comfortable with us and uh, give them the space to express themselves. Okay. And, um, and we also start every project with a research workshop where we'll uh, present what uh, certain, uh, not new design, but existing case studies that we, may, we think may relate to uh, what the client might be looking for. And it, it's also a way for us to demonstrate our own values, because we often go into rooms um, with an inkling of maybe this is something that, that you know, we, that, that, that this and our, our own marginality, I feel like plays into it is understanding the perspective of people who don't tend to be in the center of the story. Um, is to ask those questions and then see if we align. Um, so that initial meeting really helps because people, when they see visuals, get very specific about where they want to be on the spectrum of like sophisticated to inclusive and, and so on and so forth. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for being here, Gretchen. My pleasure. Other questions? I have a quick question. I was looking for the Designing Spaces publication because I think it's amazing and really interesting, but I wasn't sure where. I looked on Amazon immediately, but I, <laughs> I'm not quite sure where to get it. So currently it exists as a report that Princeton issued to its community. Um, and they said that we can share it beyond, so we can send it to Debbie and she can share it with you know, the PCAD community but we are intending to sort of approach a publisher and see if there's an, in, any interest in turning it into an actual publication. I think that would be amazing. I think what you're bringing to the discussion um, would apply to lots of different types of learning environments and, and thinking about space and pedagogy and, and how learning takes place. So I think 
um, there would be a real need. There is a real need for that. Yes, when we can all come together again, I want you to come back. <laughs> I want you to come back to the halls so PCAD and sit on the floor with all of us like you did seven years ago and just do, let's do some workshops. Let's do something together. Um, you have this humility and genuine, you know, genuineness about you that makes you so receptive. Like we just, the students just want to share. They wanted to share with you that day. And I, that's, you said it was memorable for you, but it was memorable for me. You know, I still remember. Um, and I know how I met you, Andy, it was, you were doing the design conferences at Princeton. Here's a sociology student doing this. I'm like, what? So I had to go. And you had the top names in the design industry. You had Paula, you had Gail. Um, they're like my heroes. And it was mesmerizing then. And you guys are still mesmerizing. You're amazing what you're doing. The message you're leaving behind. Thanks. <laughs> great legacy, great legacy. And you two are so young. <laughs> Don't burn yourself out. Okay. <laughs> we have like another 15 minutes with, with uh, Andy and Vikas. Are there things that, that students or our colleagues would like to know? Not a, I'll ask a question, which is that, you know, uh, I've watched, I've witnessed your amazing work at, at Princeton and, and Princeton's a well-resourced institution that has the capacity to do this. Um, PCAT is, is less well-resourced and there are lots of organizations like you talked about even the, the um, work you did around the Asian market you know, that there was a nonprofit organization that didn't have as much funding. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about doing design, inclusive design work with, with places that don't maybe have, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to blow on a project, but are really committed to wanting to transform space to communicate inclusion and belonging. Yeah, so I think that if you think about the Field Center project, for example, the production of that, I mean, it's paint and vinyl. So it's uh, not, not the most expensive materials and it's changeable, which is usually really great for institutions. Um, I think that uh, it, uh, it depends really because, um, okay, let me put it this way. So as a, um, as a studio, there's a couple of things that, that we wanna keep in mind. One is that we are fully aligned in terms of the mission, right? Because that excitement, I think is really important. Um, we went, uh, when we had turned around four or five years as a studio, we took a, um, we did a retreat and had uh, 12 advisors and us go up to upstate New York and talk about, you know, what we can do differently and how we can improve. And one of the comments we got was that just expressing excitement can go a long way because oftentimes, you know, the resources emerge from wherever uh, to make the project happen. Or you might find that a project is so exciting that it may, for example, in the case of the Happy Family Night Market project, that it may, uh, you know, as a studio, we have some leeway in you know, let's say we're doing a signage and wayfinding project with a really like uh, on, a, on a building that's a multi-year project, you know, we might be able to kind of, uh, in terms of our cost, be able to shuffle things around a little bit. Um, so there is a difference between uh, when it comes to like us being based in New York City, there's a difference between like tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. So I think that we do have a minimum in terms of like what we can actually afford to take on and pay our employees and whatnot. So we definitely are very transparent about having those conversations and very flexible in terms of how we approach things. Um, but then we operate within a spectrum of other designers that are also working either have worked at isometric before or and have started their own practices so we have lists of designers so if we think there's a really great project we'll try to find a way to connect them to a designer who could help with that particular project so there's many ways of approaching it i guess is what i'm trying to say 
I guess I'm thinking about our students who might want to emulate some of what you're doing, working with, you know, as interns at a place that's not going to take on a such a such a substantially uh, expensive type of project. Yeah, I think that's so, like there certainly is a a cost prohibition to some of these design things, and that like like you say, well resourced institutions. Um, they have more leeway to do uh, like sort of projects and very often like the diversity and inclusion budget is for some reason like a different light item for the institution <laughs> like and thought and thought of as like nice to have rather than um like essential to like building a new building and so part of what we're trying to advocate for is that instead of thinking about it as a value added um these projects are thought of from the ground up as part of uh construction budgets in the first place which tend to be more substantial um that's, that's one level. But the second one is like, as Vakas says, um, to uh, to uh, at, to the extent that we can, like for example, we took on a low budget project recently for the Juanita Craft House, which is um, a civil rights trail site in Texas, um, mm -hmm. dedicated to the pioneer uh, pioneering work of Juanita Craft who lived in that house um, and they're converting it to a museum. But it's a small like 1200 square foot property um, that like, uh, and that that is, is supposed to be filled with all these stories, and we're putting like our entire team on it, a lot of resource that vast outstrips the amount that we're being paid to work on that project. But because like we feel like, what is our role as designers? You know, it's like we've never been um, in the like we want to control our costs. Yeah, we have to stay in business in order to do the work that we do. But at the same time, like we're not motivated by money. And so it's like to us, um, the the importance of the work we do often um, far exceeds like uh, like uh, you know whether or not we're paid by a particular client like the proportional to the amount of work we're doing. So um, yeah, it's kind of a balance for us of having to find the well-resourced clients to fund the projects that can <laughs> can be both inclusive and well-paying, and then on the other hand, like. Uh, um, also be available to clients who may not have as many resources um, and to do the, you know, the same level of work for them, despite uh, the disparity. And also, Debbie, to respond to what I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're asking like if, if students at PCAD wanted to do a project themselves to create a more inclusive space on campus, right? Um, I think that there are different, um, different ways of doing that. The, the, the simplest is to, just put up quotations and images and to express values, right? And I think what we bring, or I guess the design department might be able to bring to the conversation is a briefcase of tools and strategic ways of thinking where it goes once one level up. So it has an element of engaging the community and making sure that everybody's on board with whatever is decided. It's not, uh, unlike an artwork, it's not one person's expression, right? And then, automatically it also starts to feel more institutional, like an institutional stamp of recognition for the project. And another component is the actual production. Like, is it a mural that students are painting themselves versus a lot of our projects where the actual people building it are carpenters or vinyl application you know, professionals. And that also elevates the project one level beyond that. And so I think there's a whole spectrum. And I think that, that the Space of Belonging report does uh, delve into various ways of approaching, um, you know, projects like this, which I think can be helpful. And so we have one final comment and question, which is from the president of our college, Michael Mola. He said, thank you both for the presentation today. I'm excited to view the presentation portions that, because uh, we recorded it. Um, and I would love to hear about what you are thinking about next or what concepts, questions, challenges you wish to explore. One of the biggest kind of like uh, social challenges for us is um, these uh, in the past year and especially in the past couple of months, there have been a lot of um, uh, really traumatic um, attacks on Asians and Asian Americans. And this is something we hadn't really thought about, you know, in the last, or as much, and I'll speak for myself, in the last uh, seven years or so. And only now we're beginning to excavate a history of, um, you know, discrimination of violence, of this sense of like really being a minority in this country and dealing with a double-edged sword, which is the, the model minority myth, myth because of restrictive immigration policies. A lot of Asians that are in the United States have been in the US 
are tend to be highly skilled. And so there is this false perception that for some reason, inherently, you know, Asians are smarter or inherently they're more su successful. And that becomes a wedge um, that is often used to make other minorities feel like the reason that they may not be as um, well off is because they didn't work hard enough or whatever. So that's one conceptual question we're dealing with uh, personally and in terms of our work on how to tell better stories and uh, celebrate and include uh, voices of Asian Americans. Um, and then in terms of ongoing projects, I think we have some exciting new work that's also in the studio right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're working on our first like high level museum identity for the Johnson Museum at Cornell. So we're designing like um, a, a visual identity and a website for them. First time that they've ever undergone that, that, that whole exercise. So it's very interesting. Um, we're designing an exhibition for the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis. Uh, so they're a contemporary and modern art museum. And one challenge that they face is that mostly they've shown like the historically the, the artwork of white artists, um, white male artists. Uh, in their collection because it's like Andy Warhol and um, and you know Robert Indiana are so well recognized but now they're pairing those artworks against uh, the de Kooning next to the critique piece of the de Kooning uh, by Jack Whitten for example or next to um, like artwork by Betty Saar that critiques like the um, the Aunt Jemima myth um, uh, or, or stereotype and then like um, artwork by Harodina Pendel so it's very interesting because our first contemporary art exhibit like where you have to accept the convention of the white walls, but still try to create a, a, um, a transgressive um, and there's an exhibition that challenges the master narrative. So it's like, uh, I think there's always an adventure because um, unlike projects where, or the, the, the past, I think, where designers kind of develop a style that they're known for, and they're almost like stylists that they come into each project and they kind of style it to look like their, their body of work and that's what they're being paid to do. Um, or they're coming in with a like advertising firm with a business strategy and then like selling various like ideas. We're thinking about uh, a way of doing things um, that doesn't have a particular style um, and doesn't have a particular aesthetic, but instead focuses on the content <laughs> and uh, uses that content to try to create um, as inclusive and provocative an argument for um, the, the rights of minorities as possible. You know, and also the theater project. Oh right, as I was working with. Um, this thing called the Acting Company, which is uh, founded like 60 years ago by um, uh, folks as an extension of Juilliard's acting school. And essentially um, they uh, have been operating for so long, but finally like sort of thinking about you know, in light of the pandemic, the, the um, vast effects on the, the theater industry, um, and then also uh, vast effects on minority populations, like how they can create branding and a website that feels like they're speaking to today's audiences about Shakespeare. Um, in uh, um, when they perform, sort of, you know, these classical plays, um, they always perform them repertory with uh, plays about Malcolm X, or um, you know, about about sort of you know, queerness. And and I think it's just very interesting how every industry is starting to take this lens, and we have, want to do it in sophisticated ways that doesn't diminish it to like um, a kind of uh, siloed conversation about diversity but instead you know, um, provides a more grounded and sophisticated argument for how inclusion can be built from the ground up. I was planning to wrap at 1.15, which it is, but seeing that there are a few students here, any final questions before we say farewell? I just wanted to respond, Debbie, to what you uh, asked about as well about like how students can engage with this kind of work. A lot of times, like um, schools will say, "Oh, let's make a class out of it," and then they'll find some like corporate sponsor, like I don't know, hospital, to come and do like a mural or something in the hospital. Those don't tend to work out very well because uh, there's like this grab bag of like um, different students with different ideas, and then they're forced to make one thing together, which then they have to sell to a hospital. I would say that you did a project. Like yeah, that. it sucked. <laughs> like, um, I think that like the best way to do it is to to uh, kind of treat students like professionals <laughs> that they are, and like have them comp comprise their own teams and to, uh, sort of figure out like who is the um, the institution that we want to approach, whether it's PCAT itself or a surrounding neighboring organization that could really use design. 
and say like, okay, this there we've identified this need. Here is where the um, you know the message should go. Here's the kind of effect it'll tend to achieve. I think that that gets people in the practice of how to work with com communities um, and committees of people who need to make approvals. Uh, and I think that that's as essential to the education as like making the artwork itself. <laughs> um, so that's what I would advise. Like instead of um, kind of making these like stock projects, which like are a very normal art school thing to do because that's a way of uh, getting a funding source. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, students should like build from the ground up, like identify a need in the community and figure out like, well, how do we resource this need? And, um, you know, like fi figure out like, okay, which, what grants do we apply to? You know, like which, um, you know, which uh, sort of, you know, corporations nearby like that one of our alumni is connected to, should we, <laughs> should we be talking to? And then of course, like there are sort of um, layers of working through the university to make sure that that's like appropriate. But I think that it gets people in the practice of understanding that like this work is only possible with that level of, um, of, uh, of sort of hard institutional work um, that that I think students should be. Do you think to professors do. could maybe be in a guidance role? Yeah, like absolutely. Was for us? Absolutely. Like so, um, I think the uh, art school professor should not be like either just an art director or like a coordinator of resources. Instead, they should be seen as a mentor. <laughs> like uh, like oh, I've been there. <laughs> I know how this situation works. I can tell you like how to approach this. Like for our first project with USAID, Andrew Fryben. Like made us apologize to the client when there was a, a moment of tension. And it's like, how do you apologize and take ownership for like the, um, the, the natural stress in any project, but without um, like sort of saying that, oh, what we were proposing is somehow not valuable. Like, and, I, and like learning how to do the business of design, I think um, is critical to making this kind of inclusive work happen. Yeah. Well, you really have, you know, you've changed I think I talked earlier about you changing the institution but you really have changed I think and influenced the ways in which a whole host of companies and institutions think about inclusion and space so I'm excited to see your report and uh, appreciate you sharing it with us and excited to see if that turns into a book I really think you're influencing uh, artists and designers to come in a really substantial way, not just the organizations and with, with which you work, so. Thank, thank you so much, Debbie. I'm gonna stop recording, but we can stick around for a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>